about how to lose how to lose weight and keep it off. Uh, my name is Dr. Esther Tan. I'm in charge of public health in DMOSH. DMOSH stands for Division of Healthcare Management and Occupational Safety and Health here in the UN headquarters in New York. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just to let you know that this series is really targeted for all of our UN uh, system staff. And its aim is to really improve health and wellness uh, among our staff community. Uh, if you have not yet checked out our website to review the various signature programs we have, we're going to put it on the link, uh, put a link on the chat, and so you can take a look at that. And if you're interested to actually uh, be on the mailing list for future webinars in this series, you can also sign up on a different link that we'll put up. Um, so a few admin notes, uh, all attendee lines will be muted except for the uh, host. Uh, if you have any questions during this webinar, just feel free to just put it uh, in the chat. And also, as you uh, probably know, that this is being recorded uh, for everyone's benefit for those who cannot attend today. So uh, it's my distinct pleasure to actually introduce you today, uh, Dr. Angela Fitch. I'm uh, really, really happy that she could be with us. She's probably um, the best person to talk about this. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of uh, go over her bio and explain why. So uh, she's currently the Associate Director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Weight Center and faculty at the Harvard Medical School. She is board certified in obesity medicine, internal medicine and pediatrics. She's a graduate of Iowa State University with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and um, she worked actually for PNG as a product development engineer before following her passion and attending medical school. Uh, she graduated from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and then stayed for a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, Dr. Fitch was chief resident uh, in internal medicine before moving to Minnesota to practice primary care at Fairview Health System and the University of Minnesota. And there she practiced and developed her skills for treating obesity in the primary care setting. Uh, in 2012, Dr. Fitch became the medical director for the Metabolic Health and Weight Management Clinic at Park Nicolette and began practicing obesity medicine full time. Um, and then she moved back to Cincinnati to create a multidisciplinary medical surgical weight center. And there she was also appointed medical director of the executive health program and vice president of primary care before moving to Boston. So she's currently serving as vice president uh, of the Obesity Medicine Association. And um, she was also the 2015 to 2016 chair of the clinical Man management section of the Obesity Society. She's the winner of the 2017 Clinician of the Year Award from the Obesity Medicine Association. And we're so, so happy to uh, see her today and have her with us. Uh, this is such a, a welcome topic. We had a lot of requests for, for us to uh, talk about this. So in our fifth installment, we decided that <coughs> Fitch here, she's gonna be the best person to address this. So over to you, Dr. Fitch. Uh, we're gonna have a quick um, you know, presentation in the beginning, and then uh, she and I will have a little conversation about key topics in uh, obesity and weight management issues. So over to you, Dr. Fitch. Thank you so much, Esther. That was a very nice uh, introduction, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. So thank you so much. I think somebody's unmuted. If they could go unmute, that'd be great. I'm just going to share my screen here in a second. And sometimes this, uh, hold on, let me see. Hopefully this won't when I do the slideshow. Oh, it does that. Okay. So hold on just a second. I got to reshare. I always forget I have that one step. You'd think after doing this Zoom stuff for a year and a half, I would have it like I would, I would be a master, but um, we're still working forward. Okay, doke. There we go. You should see my uh, slideshow now? Okay. So just a brief few slides to sort of introduce the topic of how to lose weight and keep it off. First of all, we have to understand this is like the, the, the million dollar question, so to speak. Like this is the, the challenge uh, before the world. And I will show you, I will, I will explain to you why. 
Uh, you may not recognize the, the pictures there because now my hair is turned gray, but um, that is a picture of me and my weight loss journey myself. Um, on the left is when I was at my heaviest at around 200 pounds. And on the right is when I was at my leanest uh, there, uh, pictured with my trainer um, in Cincinnati, um, who I miss great, greatly. And, um, you know, you can see that it does take a, uh, it, it takes a, a great deal of concerted effort, unfortunately, to uh, lose fat and um, keep it off. I have a few disclosures. I'm on some advisory boards uh, throughout medicine uh, where, you know, they ask me my opinion. So at least here in the United States, I know we're talking to people from all over the world, but um, I had here the most data from the US here showing that from 2011 to 2019, you can see this graph uh, turning progressively redder. The dark red areas are where greater than 35% of the population in those states uh, struggle with the disease of obesity. And it's important that we recognize that this is a disease that is complicated uh, for a lot of reasons. And we're still, uh, in the process of understanding that, despite the fact that our metabolism in the human body has been around for centuries, we still don't quite uh, understand that. And so uh, we're working towards understanding that across the whole world um, today, but we do have a big problem where greater than 35% of a vast majority or a good section of our country uh, is struggling with a disease that is relatively also um, untreated because of lack of access and bias and stigma towards the fact that if we have excess weight, we should be able to just do it ourselves, right? That this is a, not a disease that's worthy of treatment, that it is a disease that is uh, strictly upon the own person's responsibility. And that is not the case. That's what we've recognized uh, recently. Uh, right prior to the pandemic, um, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study here from Harvard uh, showing that the projected US state level prevalence of adult obesity and severe obesity in our country, at least, was going to top 50%. Uh, by 2030. So the projections just keep going up and up, unfortunately, despite all of our preventative health efforts of trying to increase uh, healthy food choices and increase uh, walkable areas in, in cities and other types of um, access issues to high quality nutrition. Despite all of those efforts, our obesity rates continue to climb and it's projected that by 2030, in the United States at least, greater than 50% of the United States population will have the disease of obesity. And this was prior to the pandemic. And I highlight that because um, a, a study from the American Psychological Association here in the United States showed that this was a self-reported study. So it was people just turning in information about themselves during the pandemic. But you can see here at the top where 29 pounds was the average weight gain in 42% of people that were reported undesired weight gain. So you can see that some reported undesired weight loss. So in some people potentially uh, stress and or other factors promote or access to food, for example, promote undesired weight loss. But in, in most of the people reported here on the red side of this, um, this, this slide, you can see where there was a significant increase in people's weight in the 20 to even 40 pound range, which is going to be a significant issue. In a, in a study done in the Journal of American Medical Association at the top there, that was actually a scale study. So they were actually using electronic scales that were connected to uh, in patients' homes for another study, and they just looked at what the average weight gain uh, per month in that study was on those patients that had those scales at home. And the average weight gain during the pandemic was 1.5 pounds per month. And if you think about the fact that the pandemic is still ongoing, uh, that is a lot of weight gain to continue to um, acquire uh, over and over, over a year or more's time. It's important to highlight again that obesity is a chronic treatable disease. And that's what we've come to recognize in science lately is that this is a, a, a disease. It's not a disease of willpower. It's not a, a disease of um, character flaw in, in human nature. Um, it's not about just uh, eating less and exercising more. It's much more complicated than that with the gut microbiome playing a role, uh, with stress, with other factors uh, that are taken into account in this sort of environment of the human being uh, and how it's interacting with its food environment. Obesity also is a disease in which excess body fat, and this is the definition of obesity, right? A disease in which excess body fat has accumulated to a level that may have adverse effects on health. So it's the excess body fat that's the problem, not necessarily our weight, so to speak, right? But yet the way we classify um, obesity is by BMI because it's the, the best thing we have at the moment, at least. 
to be able to easily say your BMI or your height and your weight, right? That equation is such that your, um, your body mass index fits into one of these categories. But we recognize that body mass index is not an end all be all. It's a, a, it was an epidemiological tool that was developed. It was never designed as a tool where people would, if my BMI is 30, that it should be 25 necessarily. It was never designed for people to get to a certain number. It was designed as a marker of assessing the health of an individual as it related to that BMI. But it's really about the excess body fat. And as we move forward in, in, in our um, challenges around this disease, I think we'll see more of a um, discussion around that you know, and this adiposity uh, issue, and because we can measure that today, we can measure excess adiposity a lot easier than we could many years ago um, with bioimpedance scales and other types of tools that are becoming technologically available. Um, adult obesity is also a pediatric disease, meaning that um, childhood obesity tracks into adulthood. If you look at this graph on the left, the probability of obesity at 35 years of age, if you had obesity when you were five, um, is almost one. So the probability of, of continuing that obesity, that blue line goes straight across. So kids, the important thing is here is that children with obesity do not outgrow their disease, naturally speaking. They're, if you treat it earlier, you can affect more change earlier, but it has to be treatment focused, not just prevention focused, which is sort of the 5210 approach of eating five fruits and vegetables a day, um, hour of activity, uh, screen time, et cetera. So that's, those are great um, public health tools for prevention, but for treatment of a child with a, a obesity at age five needs to be more focused on treating that disease uh, versus um, prevention efforts. We also see here that there are significant racial and ethnic disparities in obesity. And these, these disparities start even very young in life. So even at the, at the age of five here, um, the obesity uh, distinction between people of color and and people um, who are Caucasian is, is a, there's a difference here. And we have to recognize that and try to understand that better. Uh, we don't, we understand some uh, natures around that, but not as much as we need to. The big thing to recognize is that weight loss is abnormal for the human body. So when you're trying to achieve something that's abnormal for a biological process to happen, that makes it harder to accomplish, right? I mean, when people say, I wanna be a normal weight, that's true, they want their weight to be normal. But the process to get there is an abnormal process. The human body is not engineered or designed to lose weight. It's designed to protect its weight at all costs, to, to not lose weight, to not get rid of that excess adiposity. And so when you're trying to fight against uh, Mother Nature, so to speak, it becomes this tug of war that is very much a challenge. Um, as weight loss happens on the left-hand side of this picture here, on the right-hand side, the human body fights back by lowering metabolism by increasing um, neuropeptides in the human body, increasing hunger hormones that promote um, excess energy intake, sort of unconsciously, so to speak, um, by the human body, sort of promoting that weight gain coming back. And it's, it's trying to add tools to this equation that ultimately help people uh, lifelong to um, attain a lesser degree of adiposity and, and, and attain you know, a healthier weight. As we look at treatment of obesity, we have this uh, sort of treatment pyramid that we align with um, in terms of, of the intensity of treatment on the left-hand side has to match the disease severity and the, the excess BMI um, struggles that people have, right? With any disease, we do this. You know, if your blood pressure is 180 over 100, uh, we don't necessarily say go home and, and exercise and eat more vegetables. We know that exercise and eating more plants helps blood pressure get lower. But when the disease is so severe, we treat it with medication right away because we know that the risk of that going on onward is, is going to be significant. So in the same manner, we should look at obesity as well and notice that you know lifestyle modification is the basis of all health in general. I mean, trying to live the healthiest lifestyle we can in the environments that we live in is, is the key in acknowledging what that environment is and where those healthy um, uh, activities and things that we can do uh, play a role is, is very important and is sort of the base of the pyramid. But the next level of treatment would be prescriptive nutritional interventions. These would be things like intermittent fasting, uh, meal replacement plans that are now being uh, delivered in the UK, for example, for all patients with uh, diabetes, early diabetes, in order to put that diabetes into remission 
again, because now somebody has a more significant disease or more significant um, treatment, you know, disease burden related to their obesity, that they're going to employ a prescriptive nutritional intervention using the Optifast program, for example, um, in that, that um, treatment plan to produce better results. Because we get better results. We get more like five to 10% weight loss with these prescriptive nutritional interventions. Whereas with lifestyle modification alone, it typically produces a two to 5% weight loss. We know for a fact to put diseases like diabetes and other uh, severe diseases associated with obesity into remission, uh, fatty, fatty liver disease, for example, to put those diseases into remission, you need a greater than 15% weight loss. And for diabetes, for example, you probably need a greater than 20% weight loss. So if you need a greater than 20% weight loss, you're not, for example, going to just employ a lifestyle modification for that because you're not likely to get there. That's not likely to happen. And so you're going to need a more intensive approach, potentially with pharmacotherapy or endoscopic tools that are becoming available, which is like the gastric balloon, where a balloon is placed uh, inside the stomach uh, to help uh, aid in um, uh, uh, fullness and satiety and release of some of those um, hormones that we talked about. And then surgery is at the very top of the pyramid because it does produce the greatest amount of success as it relates to um, treatment uh, effect, right? This is a, a, a scaling of effective treatment. This is kind of a busy slide, but what I want to highlight here is in this red area. Again, if we're talking about getting a greater than 15 or greater than 20% weight loss for, for, for people who need it for disease resolution, for example, for greater than 20% weight loss, only about 10% of people are able to do that with lifestyle programs in that first column. So only about 10% of people in an intensive behavioral therapy type of program where someone's coming in weekly and meeting with someone or Weight Watchers, for example, only 10% of people are able to lose 20% of their weight. That, that's great for the 10% of people that are able to do that. But when patients come in to see me, for example, and they're very depressed or sad that they did this program and they're 200 pounds and they lost 20 pounds and they're very, depressed about that, so to speak, you know, meaning I only lost 20 pounds and it stopped and I want to lose 20 more, right? Well, they wanted to lose greater than 20% of their weight to begin with. And there's only a 10% chance of them getting in that category. When I tell them that they're somewhat relieved and that, oh, well, that's good. I, I don't feel like such a failure anymore that now I, I didn't fail necessarily because only 10% of people were able to do that. On the other note, when I tell people who have been successful, you know, they still might come in and they have a greater than 20% weight loss and they say, oh, but I only lost 20%, right? And, and I say, well, you know, only 10% of people are able to do what you just did. They're like, oh, that's good. Wow, look at me, you know, I'm one of the 10%. If we look at um, other types of prescriptive nutritional interventions or surgery, for example, here, 72% of people are able to lose 20% with the intervention of surgery. Um, and so again, you can see the dramatic uh, treatment effect difference if we look at some of our newer pharmacotherapy or all of our pharmacotherapy, which is this, um, the, the second half of this study here, or this, um, this table here, our new medication, which is semaglutide at 2.4 milligrams, uh, provides our, our best treatment effect today. And that's why it's been sort of highlighted um, across the world right now, because almost 40% of people are able to lose greater than 20% of their weight with the addition of this medication. Whereas with our older medications, fentramine and topiramate, that number was only about 15%. But again, you can see where you get an additional percentage when you add a treatment tool. I'll also highlight in this diagram, if you look at these uh, where I have a red here, like on, on the raglatide three milligram column, when you add intensive behavior therapy, that's what IBT stands for, to the medication, right? You get additional benefit. So whereas with, um, with this medication here, if you just do medication by itself, you get 33% of people in the greater than 10% category. But if you add lifestyle to that, you get 52% of people in that category. So obesity is not a, 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 something we just treat with one thing, so to speak. It needs to be a combination of treatments in order to get the greatest success. And this is the ultimate challenge, is that um, in this study, while 65% of people with obesity today feel that obesity is a disease, 80% of healthcare professionals feel it is a disease, 82% of people with obesity consider weight loss to be completely their own responsibility. And that isn't true of other diseases. If you have lung cancer, you don't feel like it's your own responsibility to fix it. You go to somebody to get professional help to do that. Um, but people with obesity feel, 82% of them feel it's their own responsibility. And that's the bias and stigma that we need to get rid of in the world. 
the big thing that's come about recently um, in our, our knowledge of treatment is the effect of ultra processed food. And so really the, the biggest issue with our food environment seems to be the processed nature of some of our food. And in this um, study done by Kevin Hall at the NIH, he looked at ultra processed diets in the, in the blue here versus unprocessed diets in the, in the red. And people on the ultra processed diet naturally ate 500 kilocalories more of that ultra processed food by just sort of, you know, their sort of desires of it or their, the, the behavior around that food or the interaction with that food or whatever it is about that food, they ate 500 calories more per day of the ultra processed meals, despite the fact that people were presented with the same sort of um, uh, type of food, right? So it was, it was a baked chicken uh, with, you know, with a side of potatoes or something else versus chicken tenders with French fries. Um, and so again, the sort of unprocessed food people ate 500 kilocalories less. So what works for obesity treatment? That's what you, you know, that's what we're supposed to talk about today. Um, this is sort of the acronym that I like to use uh, when I'm thinking about it, is that we all need structure in our world. The world today is very unstructured. And if you live freely in the natural environment, at least in the United States, with greater than 50% of people projected to have obesity and another 25% of people with excess adiposity in the overweight category, that means that 75% of the population by 2030 is gonna have abnormal adiposity. That means just free living in the environment is gonna produce adiposity. If you bring me a baby today and you say, will this baby have obesity when they get older? I'm going to guess yes, because at that point, you know, the, the odds are that they will if they just free live in the environment. So we need to create a structure around health of ourselves, each individually, that's gonna work for us. We have to have some sort of an accountability process uh, because again, just doing things on our own in general, whatever that is, doesn't tend to work very well. Um, Olympic athletes have coaches, even though um, they know how to swim and they know how to do gymnastics, um, they can coach anybody in the world, but they have a coach because they need that person to sort of you know, help them along with their goals and objectives, right? And that's what people need in general if we're gonna change any type of, of, of process that we're trying to live into. We have to promote metabolic alterations that promote fat loss. And this would be uh, things like surgery and medications. So that's what surgery and medication does is it gives you a metabolic alteration that promotes fat loss. For example, people that have um, obesity surgery, uh, bariatric surgery, in, those, in that surgery, it changes your gut microbiome. So it gives you a stool transplant by the surgery itself related to bile acid binding and the other factors that happen in the surgery. It's not about eating less for those patients. It's about those metabolic alterations that then promote the surgical effects of treatment. Environmental stimulus control is the idea that, again, if we free live in the, in the environment that we're at today, um, we have a tendency towards excess adiposity storage. So we have to try to figure out ways of effectively controlling that environment. So I have my five Ps that I'd like to leave you with, six Ps, sorry, I used to have five, but I added another one, so I have to get used to that, um, which is the idea that it really isn't as sort of, you know, complicated as it needs to be, right? That we have to focus on having planned portions. The idea that we, that we skip meals all the time, that we're in too much of a hurry to eat, and then we might overeat at the next meal. The idea of having planned portions is very important. The idea of eating plants and protein focusing on that protein intake and getting protein with each meal, whether that be plant-based protein or, or um, other types of protein. Power, doing some sort of a physical activity daily, and especially in the resistance category. So building muscle mass, what I, what I was showing you with my trainer, you know, so as to increase your resting metabolism is, is a huge thing that needs to be focused on in our, in our world. Um, pillow, getting a good night's sleep, because not getting enough sleep actually also promotes uh, weight struggles. And then pausing, trying not to eat for at least 12 to 16 hours a day, which is the concept of intermittent fasting. So what we can do from here, and I'm excited to get into a discussion uh, with uh, Dr. Tan, is recognize that obesity is, it's your chemistry, not your character, right? This is not about a character flaw of individuals. This is about chemistry and biology and the interaction of that in the environment. And we have ways of manipulating that today with medications and surgery if necessary, or ways of manipulating that with prescriptive nutritional interventions or intermittent fasting or other ways of, of trying to manipulate that chemistry. Follow a whole food diet 80% of the time where, where possible. Uh, move more, not for weight loss, but for maintenance and other health benefits. 
prioritize um, stress reduction in sleep. And if you want or need to lose weight, decide how much you're, you're looking to lose, right? And then if it's greater than 10 to 20% or you have type two diabetes, then consider a prescriptive nutritional intervention, medication or surgery, not because it's a failure of your own part, but because it helps you to be more successful. And most importantly, talk to your doctor or care professional um, to, or seek an obesity treatment specialist if, if that's something that uh, you feel is necessary because you've tried other things. And I'll leave you with that and Esther and I will get into a discussion. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Fitch. Uh, that was really, really enlightening. Um, and um, I have so many questions after that. Um, so we're gonna spend the next 20 minutes um, just having a conversation um, and then followed up with kind of dealing with some of the questions that come in through the chat. So um, just to start off, um, I just was curious to kind of hear a little bit about your own journey. And I saw that picture in the beginning. Was that why you, you moved from chemical engineering into medical school? Was that part of that or not really? No, I, I didn't gain weight, unfortunately, until after medical school. That's what medical school and residency does to you. I mean, uh, staying up all night and back in the day of when I was in residency and uh, um, sort of, you know, going to the cafeteria. And it's amazing what staying up all night does to you. You know, like when you're, when you stay up all night, the next day you crave things. Like every day I would crave like a, a sausage and egg biscuit from McDonald's because I was like post-call and I hadn't slept for more than like two hours. And it was funny how you could recognize that in your body. You're like, why do I want a sausage and egg biscuit? Like, I don't usually like sort of want that thing. Um, but it's, it's funny how your body does that when it doesn't sleep. And um, we know that scientifically and, uh, you know, but you do have this sort of tendency, you know, to sort of grab a donut in the doctor's lounge or, you know, it's funny, we also, even with the pandemic, you know, we, we tend to love our, our people with, with food that is um, not so healthy sometimes, right? We tend to show our love by, by giving donuts or in America, at least, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in other countries, but, um, you know, with the pandemic, I always saw these posts online of, you know, the nurses and the doctors getting, you know, cakes and cookies and cupcakes and, and sweets. And it's like, you know, it's, it's challenging. I mean, uh, when, when that's like sort of hanging out there in the lounge, you know, to sort of not consume that. Mm, great. Um, and talking about food, I mean, uh, you mentioned this interesting slide just now about ultra processed versus um, unprocessed diet. So can you give us some examples of what are those, I mean, when you say unprocessed, do you mean organic stuff? Like no, no. people yeah. decide which is which kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, I had a patient say that because I said, well, you need to, you know, have a whole food diet. And she's like, I need to go to Whole Foods, you know, which is a Whole Foods is a, um, uh, a um, I think someone is sharing their screen. Uh, you, um, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Yes, thank you. Yes, go um, ahead. So I was saying that, um, uh, you know, I had a patient say, you mean I have to shop at Whole Foods? Whole Foods is a store here in the United States. I said, no, 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 that doesn't mean that at all. It means, you know, you're, you're eating sort of more natural foods, right? Foods that come from the earth, not from a package. So things like, you know, broccoli and, and uh, you know, um, chicken and, you know, things that are just um, unprocessed that aren't made by a, um, by a company, you know, and, and put in a box, right? That's really what we're talking about. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, beans, legumes, um, those types of foods uh, versus processed food. Mm -hmm. um, and is, is that similar to, you know, this whole whole plant diet that I hear a lot about? Um, is that similar, like, but it's just that you eat the plant? Well, that's back to what I said, right? We should, we should have more plants and protein, right? I mean, if we really think about it, we should do plants and protein every three to four hours. So if I'm going to have something and I'm going to eat something, what's a plant and what's a protein that I can eat, right? So plants are things like nuts. Protein is nuts, right? So, oh, let me have some nuts that serves both features. Or maybe I have some walnuts and an apple, you know, so that's a plant and a protein, you know, so pairing these plants and proteins every three to four hours is really what is the key to success, you know, versus just grabbing a, um, you know, a, a granola bar, um, which again is packaged as being very healthy. Right, but it's it's really a, a processed uh, food, so to speak, right? Versus a, a sort of like, I'm gonna, you know, like I said, grab a handful of walnuts and an apple. And I, I've, you know, it comes to processed food. I've also read that like, um, you know, companies sometimes kind of add things into the food and make people more addicted to it. Is that true or? 
well there's that the industry there's, do that yeah yeah there's that but there's also you know all the other the other things that have come up in discussion around obesity is all the just additives in our food right the preservatives the emulsifiers right so so the emulsifiers that are in food, which are things that keep things creamy, for example. So emulsifiers are they're things like lecithin, which is brought into ice cream to keep it sort of creamy when you go to, you know, because it's being stored, right? It's not like ice cream you would get at a dairy where they're literally taking the cows from the back and turning it into ice cream and you're going to go get it that day, right? That's a different ice cream than the ice cream that's packaged in a container and put into the store. Um, and you know, with those with those um, emulsifiers in it, those emulsifiers um, then um, break down the lining of your intestine, the the lipid lining of your intestine. Your intestines are protected by a lining of fat, and emulsifiers are designed to break down fats. Right, that's what they're designed to do. And so, if you put those things in there chronically, now having you know a little bit of that every now and then is not going to cause that. But the idea is this sort of combination of all the chemicals and all the other things that are in our food environment is, is what is potentially challenging our system, right? To be healthy, like from a gut microbiome and all the other factors that play a role. Um, the other question I have relates to kind of the role of like emotional eating. You know, you, you read a lot about that and that. Um, so kind of what's the role of like psychology into this as well um, and those sort of interventions? Yeah, so there's a huge role for that because many people struggle with that. And that's where I said, you know, if you want to lose weight and you're trying to lose weight, you need to identify, you know, what things are getting in the way, so to speak, or what, you know, what is causing that. And we all, you know, emotionally eat to a certain extent. Most people do. Some people don't. I mean, some people, it's rare that a lot of some people emotionally don't eat, you know, so when they get emotional, they might like not eat. But that's a sort of personality trait that's not necessarily a flaw you know, if you struggle with emotional eating, it's very natural because you're sort of comforting yourself with something that's very palatable. To your point earlier, Esther, um, you know, all of our food companies, like they engineer these foods, particularly to make them more palatable so that more people buy them. I mean, they are, they are that in business to do that, to, to, to create more, you know, sales, right? And so they want it to be tastier. Um, and so when it's tasty and you, you know, want something to feel better, you tend to then, you know, gravitate towards something that is, is, is tasty. But that's where I think I didn't talk a lot about it. But, you know, that's where in that lifestyle intervention, that bottom part of the pyramid, right, comes into play, you know, the idea of mindful eating, like we all should focus on eating more mindfully, so that when we have a desire for a piece of chocolate or some, you know, a, a cake or something, that we really sit down, enjoy it, we say, oh, this is so delicious. And we really sort of you know, take it in in a mindful way, not in a sort of mindless way where we're, you know, driving in the car and, you know, putting the next um, uh, M and M in our mouth, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, associated with that, what what are your thoughts about kind of portion sizes? And you know, you mentioned structure and so kind of planning your meal. So is it kind of saying planning that I'm only going to eat this amount for for the breakfast? You know, is that something like yeah. that? Yeah. It is because it's very hard to feel satiated sometimes with some of the foods that we have in our environment. And so that's the, the, the challenge is trying to um, really, you know, be mindful of portion sizes and still feel that satiation. Um, things like, you know, drinking water beforehand to try to, you know, give you some extra um, feeling of fullness, right? Because everybody has a, what I was trying to highlight is we think a lot of people have a different sensation of fullness at different, at different levels, right? If you've ever um, myself included, you know, I would go out to lunch with some of my friends that were naturally leaner, you know, by their nature and, and they're like done and they have half their plate still there. And they're like, I'm full. And I'm like, hmm, can I have the rest of it? Yeah. You know, cause I'm like, I'm still hungry. And so it wasn't until, for example, myself that I actually started taking medication that I was actually able to be successful because the medication really helps me to feel fuller because I do think there is this sort of natural tendency of certain people to have this. We haven't figured that out yet. We can't measure that. Um, but one of the drivers that, that I have, as you mentioned earlier, is um, my brother is 450 pounds and he uh, struggled with his weight since he was very little. I mean, if you look at pictures, he had obesity as a child, but that was in the 1980s when we weren't really paying a lot of attention to it. Um, meaning I never remember my mother ever you know, noticing that he was heavier, right? He was just 
he played football and he was good at football because he was very large and you know people liked that that he was you know he almost got sort of rewarded for you know being larger so to speak um and uh but then now he struggles with a lot of health issues, you know, related to that. But the, but that's that genetic component of obesity that I didn't highlight a lot is that there's this genetic tendency towards struggles with our weight, you know, that that fall in my family. You know, my my parents are both heavy as well, and so again, you know, we have to recognize uh, some of these genetic issues that that are there, and then maybe offer different treatments for different people. Mm -hmm. um and related to kind of um, trying to lose weight and exercise, uh, you know, I always see that people say that you know exercise is sometimes not that helpful in terms of the whole scheme of things that you know controlling your intake is more helpful. I mean, like, what is the balance here? Um, what is the exercise versus food? Yeah, yeah yes, because... that's a great question. So um, again, not having a, a lot of time to sort of that could be a whole lecture in and of itself, but. Most recently, there was a very significant article published uh, by Dr. Ponzer here in the United States that does show, because I saw a couple of questions in the chat too, you know, about midlife. Um, that study showed that we, our metabolism actually doesn't start to decrease until we're in our 60s. So um, as we gain weight when we get older, um, it is not because necessarily our metabolism going down. Like that's what people say. Not, a, not is, an excuse then. Not an excuse. No, that's yeah. what the study showed. It's a very, very um, complicated, you know, very interesting study. Um, mm -hmm. So it really is, the studies have also overwhelmingly shown that exercise itself does not produce a lot of weight loss. Mm -hmm. Exercise is important for weight maintenance. And exercise is important for so many other reasons, mental health and like just, you know, cardiovascular fitness. I mean, decreasing your risk of death, even if you do have heavier weight. So there's studies to show that people, for example, that were very active, even though they might be heavier, this mm -hmm. idea that, that you could be heavier and be healthy, those people didn't, um, uh, don't struggle as much with, with risk of disease, right? Because of their activity. So activity can also counterbalance some things, you know, in our world, but it doesn't cause a lot of weight loss. And that's what like I was struggling with, for example, is I was working out, I got a Peloton, I got a trainer, I was losing like two pounds, right? <laughs> it wasn't until, you know, I could employ another treatment option that actually that, you know, was able to get 30 pounds off, which is greater than 10% of my, which is, you know, greater than it was like 15% of my weight. And so that's just the, the, the challenge that we have before us is sort of, like you said, it's really a bigger issue with our food, right? Mm -hmm. It's about, it's about quality. It's about quantity and mm -hmm. it's about timing. As I mentioned, I see a lot of questions in the chat about intermittent fasting and mm -hmm. and the fact that um, you know some of that's come about. It is it is we don't know the effects of that in humans yet. We have not done large human clinical trials. Most of the trials come out of animals at this point. But the idea is that there is some sort of a metabolic advantage for having a window of time at least when you're not eating. It doesn't have to be the the 16 hours is the sort of the most extreme in which that's where your, your benefits don't get any greater sort of beyond that, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? So in other words, 12 hours is good. 16 is a little bit, you know, is the sort of, you know, where you sort of reached your maximum um, benefit metabolically. And so if, you, if, you, if that works for you, you know, that is a mechanism, especially because a lot of people, you know, have access to food a lot all the time and easily can eat, you know, very late into the evening. Um, mm -hmm. And so this idea that we eat sort of all the time, all day versus, you know, in these windows of time is, is the, what's being researched uh, quite greatly right now at the moment. So does that mean that in your opinion, snacking is not a good thing that we should structure kind of just three meals a day or whatever? No, it really, we don't have good data on that either, right? Because oh. um, um, for some people, snacking might be good, and for other people, snacking might be bad. I think an intentional mm -hmm. snack is good so as not to get too hungry, because mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is what a lot of people do, or a lot of, what I see a lot of people do, at least in America, is they don't eat all day, but they'll eat like little bits. You know, they'll eat like, you know, they'll drink some coffee with cream in it. So if you do that, you're not fasting anymore. You know, you had some cream, you had some calories, and then they'll maybe grab a, maybe they'll grab a soda, or maybe they'll grab like a, a granola bar or something, you know, throughout the day. But they're not eating like structured sort of meals and snacks. And then they come to the evening and then they're going to eat a large portion of calories in the evening. You know, even if it's a standard meal, like a you know, chicken, broccoli, rice, 
carrots, you know, salad, I mean, a little bit of dessert, you know, but, but now they're eating like 1500 calories in, in one sitting mm -hmm. in, late in the evening. And, and that's going to cause potential. The more we eat later in the day, the more that gets stored as energy as fat. Okay. So, so it is true that, uh, you know, I, I always read that you should not eat like after 8 PM or something. Is there like a cutoff and what, what is the actual reason for behind that? And I'm not so, eating late in the day. Yeah, because there's some research that shows, I didn't show that here, but there's some research that shows that, that, that eating later in the day, um, again, that more of that, that, that intake then gets, tends to be stored more as energy, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're not in a deficit. Right. So eating later in the day tends to to that, that food tends to be like they did a study in, for pe people with diabetes and they looked at they gave them a structured eating plan in which they had a 300 calorie breakfast and a 700 calorie dinner or they swapped mm -hmm. that and they had a 500 calorie lunch. So they all had these, you know, they gave them meals. Right. And they had a 300 calorie breakfast, 700 calorie dinner, 500 calorie lunch. And then they swapped the, they gave people a 700 calorie breakfast and a 300 calorie dinner, something like that. Mm -hmm. It might've been a little bit different numbers, but that was the idea, right? The people that had the 700 calorie breakfast and the 300 calorie dinner actually lost more weight, even mm -hmm. though all, both of them had 1500 calorie meal plans. Oh, interesting. Right. And so, so that was the, um, that was the, that was interesting, right? And that mm -hmm. was coming from some data that's shown in the lab and other places, these controlled eating studies, right? It's very hard to do nutritional studies. We have to also recognize that, right? Because I mean, it's hard to, you can't like with Kevin Hall's study, he put people in a lab like at the NIH and they lived there and ate <laughs> food. <laughs> like, you know, so, I mean, it's very challenging to, to do that for very long. You know, you can't mm -hmm. do that for six months, you know, and see what happens to people. So, you know, it, but, but again, there is this concept that the later that we eat, more of that energy may be partitioned into storage of adiposity, you know, mm -hmm. versus, um, versus uh, sort of burning it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just going to quickly move on to the question because I see so much and we don't have too much time. So I'm just going to take it from the top. And if there is repetition, I'm going to skip it quickly. Um, First question, can you explain the role of insulin resistance in weight gain and how do we deal with, uh, how do we treat uh, insulin resistance? Yeah, so that's very important. And, um, you know, I think, again, we're really at our infancy of knowing, you know, what insulin resistance is really, um, we know a lot of people have insulin resistance. I have a lot of uh, my pediatric population that have significant um, acanthosis nigricans, which is a darkening of the skin on the back of the neck, in the um, armpits, in the in the groin area. Um, I had a 12 year old I saw the other day and we started talking about her skin and the coloration on her skin and she started crying uh, because she tries to, to um, scrub it off, right? And it doesn't come off. And, and you know, she thought it was dirty, right? And that, that there was something wrong with her. And it's very outward appearance then that this is, you know, something that's very troublesome and bothersome. Um, but it is related to insulin resistance. Her fasting insulin level was like 70. Uh, when normal is about 10, you know, so she has seven times the amount of insulin in her body, even at a fasting level uh, being produced in response to that adiposity milieu, you know, that is her human nature at the moment. Um, and again, that insulin resistance is complicated, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, adiposity, increased adiposity increases insulin resistance and increased insulin resistance increases fat storage. So it's like a vicious cycle of of um, that needs to be broken. And I, I know somebody mentioned metformin, right, is a medication that we use quite commonly for that insulin resistance, um, as well as, again, working on this whole food diet, you know, that, that is, is frankly lower in carbohydrates, um, relational, right? For, and that doesn't mean no carbohydrates, but you do have to sort of especially uh, minimize processed carbohydrates in particular mm -hmm. in order to affect more change on that resistance struggle. Okay, thank you. And the second question relates to also about carbohydrates. Like what's your view on no carbs diet? There are all sorts of different diets, but um, does it work? So, or so that would be in the, that would be in the prescriptive nutritional intervention category, right? That's where I would put that, right? Is that that is a prescriptive nutritional intervention 
to therapeutically reduce your carbohydrates. So what we're calling it now is therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. So really you're again, intentionally because other things have not worked for you or maybe that's the route that you think is gonna work best for you, right? Um, but if you think that works best for you, it is, a, it is a valid approach. And there's been some scientific things coming out around uh, ketosis, you know, and the idea that when our body is in ketosis that it may have a metabolic benefit or it may have a, um, it may have a, um, a mental health benefit. So there's been some mental health literature uh, looking at that, the effects of the ketogenic diet or the ketogenic lifestyle um, on uh, uh, mental health, right? So there's a lot of, of potential good things that can come out of that, but people have to be really have significant, create significant structure and accountability in their world to live that way because our world mm -hmm. is not designed that way, or at least not in America. Um, we have aisles in the grocery store of cereal and, and, and crackers. There's a whole aisle. I mean, we have 18 versions of Triscuits, which are crackers that one might eat um, for, you know, a snack. And I don't think we need 18 versions, right? I mean, you know, that's, the, that's one of the, the struggles that we have. All right, the next question relates to um, how, we, how fat is distributed around the body. So if it's concentrated in a belly, apparently it's more dangerous. Can you speak yeah. to that? Yeah. yeah, so abdominal adiposity, again, is, is more a marker too of insulin resistance a lot of times or metabolic uh, derangements, right? Mm -hmm. This metabolic health sort of idea that our metabolic health is, um, is, uh, is also, you know, a marker of having that increased oh. adiposity around the midsection. Um, and so it is a, you know, using waist circumference, right? That's where waist circumference comes into play, especially in regions where you don't have access to um, uh, body composition testing. Again, we, we, we do that at our clinic with a fancy body composition machine that we have that can tell you how much, you know, adiposity around your midsection you have. Um, and so, but again, waist circumference is very telling as well. Um, and decreasing that waist circumference is what the goal should be, you know, and that's very easy to do by a tape measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to kind of monitor your what waist circumference as you mm -hmm. lose weight, or right? Yeah, because that can be, you know, because the other thing is, right, that's what I got at, at the beginning, is that you want to lose fat and gain muscle, right? So you don't really necessarily want to lose weight. I mean, ultimately, depending on how much weight you have, you do probably want to lose weight. But um, you know, my brother who's 450 pounds, he wants to lose weight, right? He doesn't want to like just stay 450 pounds and be that much muscle, that high a muscle mass, right? So, and that would be very hard to do. But the point is that we want to gain muscle and lose fat. And so, especially at the lower weights, if you're, if your body, if your, if your BMI is closer to normal, it becomes harder to do that, right? You want to change your, your level of adiposity. And we see that a lot, especially in, um, at least in, in, the United States in women who, who tend to be somewhat smaller in nature, you know, have a BMI, for example, of, of 29, 30, uh, but have like 45% body fat because traditionally they haven't been sort of doing a lot of strength training or doing a lot of, um, you know, it, it isn't sort of natural for us to necessarily do any kind of strength activity anymore. I mean, unless you're a, um, you know, work in construction or you're working in a, as a farmer or in the field, but even those people, their jobs have changed where they don't have as much strength. You know, there's more machines that are doing things for us instead of, you know, doing it ourselves. So speaking about that, what's the role of strength training versus cardio? Because I, I read that some people say they can lose a lot of weight just <laughs> without doing cardio and just by strength training. Yeah, it's fact, strength training is becoming much more of a focus of, of, in, in terms of fat loss, right? So strength training is very important because again, the more you build strength, and again, that's where the protein comes into play too. And that focus on, on our protein in our, in our diet is because we need protein to build muscle mass. And if you just have you know, oatmeal for breakfast and you have um, uh, some you know, chips for a snack and you have um, a sandwich for lunch and you have an apple for a snack, and then for dinner you have, let's say spaghetti, Okay, that would be a sort of an American, you know, a potential American diet for somebody, which isn't a lot of necessarily, might not be a lot of calories, might not be even overeating. What I just described might be a very small number of calories, right? But that person might wonder, you know, why am I not losing weight? Well, because there's very little protein in what they just consumed, 
right? And, and, and then if they're not doing strength training and sort of gaining that muscle mass back, we lose muscle mass every year by nature. Like we just lose muscle mass if we're not doing some sort of strength-based activity. Um, and it doesn't have to be weights, right? It can be resistance bands. It can be um, body weight exercise. It could be, you know, um, uh, push-ups, right? On the, uh, and squats and other types of body weight type of activity. But that is what's important at least two days a week. Um, people should be incorporating strength training into their routine, especially if you've been trying to lose weight and you're, and you're doing some cardio and you're doing some uh, changes in your diet and you're not losing weight, then that strength training is really the next thing to, to put in there. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, WHO recommends that, like you mentioned twice a week, that everyone should do some strength training, whether weights or other type. Yeah. But it's harder than you think, right? I was trying to challenge myself to do that. And that's where I had to, like myself, I had to have the trainer, a, you mm -hmm. know, professional, because I just wouldn't do it myself, because mm -hmm. it just isn't sort of natural for me, you know, like I would just do my cardio, right? But, but doing the strength training was like harder for me to sort of put into play without like somebody kind of like, you know, like having an appointment and doing it. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Um, another question about supplements that people take. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of over the counter things that may not be exactly medicine, but you know, whatever extract or whatever. What do you think about such things? Are they, do they work or? Well, I think um, there is some data on some, um, you know, some uh, herbal treatments that actually do have effect on appetite. For example, mm -hmm. uh, berberine. Um, berberine also may have an effect on insulin resistance. Um, ashwagandha is another uh, herbal type of or a plant-based, you know, um, uh, intervention uh, that may have an effect on appetite as well. So there are these things and there's studies on them. They're very, um, you know, we don't have a lot of data, unfortunately. We don't have the large clinical trials we need to see if they actually make a difference because it's very hard to do those clinical trials, you know, from a, a financial standpoint. And a lot of those companies don't have the resources that large, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies have to do these types of treatment, you know, these types of trials to prove efficacy. But I think right now for what we know, you know, we do have some pharmaceutical interventions that are more successful, you know, than not doing pharmaceutical intervention. Now you have to weigh the side effects and other types of things. But for right now, what I tell patients is at least our pharmaceutical interventions are much more likely to give you the result, at least for now. If for some reason you're, you're leery about the pharmaceutical interventions or other things, certainly, yes, I mean, there are some of these things that may be helpful, right? And you should, certainly can try them. But the downside is they're very expensive usually. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're spending all that money on something, I'd rather they spend it on a trainer or um, you know, sending away for a, 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 a meal um, service you know, that might deliver uh, you know, meals um, versus uh, spending it on the herbal supplement that may or may not work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, that's the challenge. And, you, and also you know, the other issue we have, at least in the United States around that is not knowing you know, how much, because you know, they're not regulated as well you know, you can't be certain, you know, what you're getting sometimes, but. Okay. Um, another question about gut bacteria and what that role is in weight loss. And that, that's interesting as well, yeah. I know, that's a, that could be a whole topic in and of itself, right? I mean, yeah. gut bacteria, but I mean, that might be something you could do as a future talk uh, because, you know, it also affects mental health, Alzheimer's. You know, there's been a lot of data coming out about gut bacteria and its interaction with our health, right, as a whole. Um, and it really does probably, you know, play a significant role in obesity for sure. We know that because we have, if you take the gut bacteria from a lean mouse and you give it to a mouse that is heavy, a mouse that is, has obesity, um, you, um, the, the mouse with obesity becomes lean from that stool yeah. transplant. Um, we cannot do that in humans. We have not been successful in doing it in humans. Uh, we know that there's a gut bacterial profile of people with obesity that is obesogenic, so to speak. You know, we have this gut bacteria profile that says, okay, that is an obesogenic gut bac bacteria profile, but we cannot uh, figure out a way quite yet to shift it um, for people. I mean, they've done studies in stool transplantation in humans, uh, you know, replicating the mouse study, so to speak, and it has not been uh, successful to date. Um, but we do know, for example, from the bariatric surgery data, that when patients have surgery for obesity, that their gut bacteria changes to a lean gut bacteria profile, like within the, the next week or so after surgery. So it's very profound. The metabolic changes that happen with surgery are extremely profound and are extremely effective 
if people are, are at that stage where they're ready to say, okay, I'm gonna employ a surgical intervention in order to treat my disease, right? And that's a, that's a personal you know, decision and discussion, um, but it is the most effective treatment we have for various reasons, because it changes your gut microbiome, it changes your, um, your gut, gut hormone levels, uh, it changes your bile acid binding. There is something specific to bile acids in our, in our gut that relates to our weight. And that's the, the research that's been being really focused on right now too, is how to affect change in those bile acids. Cause we have not figured out how to do that other than surgery. Um, when you have surgery, you change these bile acids. And when you, when you affect that change, you produce weight loss. Um, and it's, it's really those metabolic changes that are, that the surgery is doing, not just making people eat less. I mean, patient, people across the world think that the reason surgery works is because you eat less after surgery. And that is the very small percentage of, of you, know, you know, why surgery works, right? The bigger piece of it is this metabolic hormonal changes, which some of the medications we have today are replicating. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as kind of eating probiotic uh, like supplement that you get on over the counter. Yeah, so you can try that, but again, they're very expensive and they haven't been shown to date to produce, you know, weight loss effects, right? I mean, probiotic supplementation, um, now prebiotic supplementation, which is fiber. So there is a deficiency of fiber in our world for a lot of people. Um, and so a prebiotic fiber, such as inulin, um, has been shown in some studies of pediatric weight management, at least, to affect some change in BMI uh, by supplementing inulin into the the, the system. And so again, this focus on fiber, you know, giving our gut bacteria something to eat because the gut bacteria need to eat fiber. And if you're just taking probiotics, for example, and you're not mm -hmm. taking any fiber with it, you're just giving, you just, you're just, you know, wasting your money. You're just putting it in and, and putting it out in the toilet. <laughs> so it's just going through because it's not going to, you know, stick without that fiber there. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have um, just a few minutes left. I'm just gonna kind of give the million dollar question. So obviously, you know, many people want to know kind of why they're stuck in a plateau. You know, they might have lost some weight and then, um, you know, what could be the kind of the causes there and, you know, how should they go about the next step to break that kind of plateau? Yeah. Right, well, I think it's important to, rec to it's important to, um, to, you know, assess where you've come from and where you're at, right? And because again, it's to recognize that table that, you know, really it's hard to lose greater than 5% of your weight. You know, we saw that in, in, in good studies of people doing intensive behavior therapy, you know, really focusing on their diet and exercise, right? And really focusing on that. Only 48% of people are able to lose greater than 5% of their weight in doing that. So I think a lot of times our expectations are different than what reality is. So we have mm -hmm. to also sort of come to a level of peace, you know, with where we're at and a level of peace with, we're doing our best, right? We're trying our best and, and really, you know, health, you know, doesn't have to be about our weight, right? A number on the scale, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, you know, if you can get an assessment of your body composition, you know, that's an, a good place to start because for a lot of people, they think they need to lose more weight, but really they're, they're quite close to normal, right? Or they may need to lose some, some abdominal adiposity, which may take more focus on carbohydrate reduction or you know, specialized parts of their day, right? Eating less at night, like we talked about, you know, um, sleeping better. I mean, that's a big component to our weight, independent of, of, of what we're eating, right? When we don't sleep, we don't burn as many calories in the night. Um, when we don't sleep well, when we, when we don't get our REM sleep, right, we, we don't burn as many calories functionally. So we're in a caloric deficit already, or I mean, a, you know, a disadvantage already when we start our day. Um, so it, it's, it's, more, it's a lot more complicated uh, is the point, but, but reach out to somebody. Someone asked if there's like virtual consultation mm -hmm. and things like that. Most of us do have virtual consultation, although not across the pond or anything <laughs> like meeting um, because of laws and restrictions around telemedicine. Um, uh, but, um, but yes, I think, you know, speaking to someone about it, working with someone about it, um, it is, is important no matter where you are, uh, and trying to understand, you know, what you might be able to change. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a lot more questions. Some are pretty specific. Um, so I'm not sure what's the best way to, um, answer some, you know, 
There's a question about the role of DPP4 enzyme. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just quickly tackle some of these very specific ones? Yeah, I think um, for that, there's not, um, uh, so th that uh, DPP4 uh, prevents the breakdown of GLP-1 and GLP-1 is the primary um, hormone that's related to our metabolism. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it's about trying to keep more GLP-1 around. I mean, that's what we want to do. These are a lot of our medications we have today, including semaglutide, which I understand will be released throughout the world. If it, it, I don't think it has been already, but it's coming across the, the, the it's a Denmark company, Novo Nordis, that makes it. So it's going to be, going to be a, around globally. Um, but some of the other medications are unfortunately more specific to the United States. Um, and that is also a challenge for people in other regions. Um, there is another question about um, the type of medication. Let me just quickly see. Um, um, interested in your opinion about glucagon analogs, like ly lyraglutide. Yeah. yeah, there's going to be like, so liraglutide is a um, GLP-1. So GLP-1 is the, the primary neurochemical that, one of the primary neurochemicals that regulates our metabolism. And GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, is why people with, one of the reasons people with surgery have such great profound effects of weight loss. Um, because when you have surgery, your body makes tons of its own GLP-1 um, by, by the effect of the surgery. Um, but if you give yourself liraglutide or semaglutide, which are GLP-1 receptor agonists, if you give yourself that medication, then, then you you are essentially you know, giving yourself more of this GLP-1, uh, which promotes uh, you know, fat loss in the human body, so to speak, as well as satiety and decrease hunger and decrease cravings and decrease drive to eat. So, um, but there are others, other biochemicals as well that are coming down the pike um, where in the future we'll have even triple analogs that'll, um, you know, triple chemicals that, that will affect metabolism in, in various different ways. So. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think we're done uh, in terms of time, uh, but I'm really grateful to you, uh, Dr. Fitch, for being here with us. This is a really super important topic that you know many people are struggling with. And so, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, all feel free to shoot them over to our generic email address. Um, and um, hopefully, maybe we'll have you back another time to discuss one of the more, you know, the other expand on the other topics. But thank you so much uh, for for doing this. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And thank you all. It's great to meet you from around the world. It's so fun to be with people from all across the world because, you know, today's day and age, we're kind of stuck where we're at, I feel like sometimes. And so it's nice to be with people from all over. Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, we'll see you at the next series uh, next month. And we haven't thought of a topic yet, but feel free to uh, shoot us a note if you have uh, some topics in mind. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.